Hello everyone, my name is Samantha and I will be today's webinar moderator. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Ending COVID-19, The Vaccine, Technology and Logistics Challenges, presented by Dr. Eric James, Dr. John Lidecker and Dr. Zhao Zhi Wei. Before we get started, I would like to go over the format for this webinar. The webinar will begin with presentations by each speaker and will end with a question and answer period. All lines will be placed on mute during the presentation. You may post written questions during the webinar by using the chat or question box. After the presentations, all questions will be answered. And during this time, you will also have the opportunity to ask questions verbally by raising your hand. Dr. Adam Higgins, president of the Society for Cryobiology, will start us off by introducing our first speaker. Dr. Higgins, you may begin. I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Eric James. He received his Bachelor of Science from London University, a Master of Science and PhD from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And there have been two main components that have run in parallel throughout his career, tropical infectious diseases, where he has worked mostly on the host parasite interaction and immunity and vaccine development um, in cryobiology. His involvement with cryobiology began by a collaboration with the MRC cryobiology unit at the Northwick Park Hospital in London in the lab of John Ferrant, where they developed the first vitrification methods using high concentrations of cryoprotectant additives and rapid cooling to cryopreserve these multicellular organs for storage of the vaccine. This led to work on cryopreservation of many other parasites, both protozoa and helminths, and more recently at the biotech company Scenaria, development of GM GMP methods to vial and cryopreserve the aseptic attenuated and purified sporozoites of malaria used for a malaria vaccine that's now entering phase three clinical trials. With the malaria vaccine, Dr. James Main's research focus is the, in developing the below minus 150 Celsius cold chain for distribution of the malaria vaccine to travel medicine clinics and for use in elimination campaigns in malaria endemic countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. James, you may begin your presentation entitled Vaccine Logistics. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, Looks good. Your screen. Good, thank you, Adam, for that introduction. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this Joint Society for Cryobiology and ISPA sponsored webinar. So, the title of my presentation is Vaccine Logistics. Put simply, this is synonymous with the vaccine cold chain the network of operations and equipment that takes vaccines from storage at the end of the manufacturing process and distributes them to the immunization clinics. My presentation will look at vaccine logistics in general, but of course, will feature the current effort to distribute the new coronavirus vaccines. So the rapid development and translation into manufacturing of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines has been spectacular. The first two out of the gate, the BNT162B2 vaccine from Pfizer-BioNTech and the mRNA1273 from Moderna, particularly the Pfizer vaccine, came under much early criticism, even before they became approved, because of the need to keep these vaccines frozen at low temperatures. Of course, the media thrives on negativity, and the description of an impending logistical nightmare for distribution was mentioned widely. So key features of the logistics of the Pfizer vaccine are, and I quote from the FDA fact sheet, that it requires storage at ultra low temperature freezers between minus 80 and minus 60, and that it must be shipped in special thermal containers, which can be used as temporary storage. These thermal containers are built from an outer carton um, into which are placed up to five trays, each holding 195 vaccine vials in a 13 by 15 array. 23 kilos of dry ice is placed on top of the stack. And with the monitoring device in place, this is closed up in a rigid outer overpack carton. These multi-dose vials from which five standard syringes or six load dead space syringes with staked needles can be filled. Hence, each carton can hold up to 5,850 doses. Here we see workers at the Pfizer facility in Kalamazoo loading trays of vaccine vials into the carton. And two days after the vaccine was authorized for emergency use by the FDA, 
FedEx trucks were moving vaccine out to their distribution hub. The other third party logistics company or 3PL contracted to move vaccine is UPS. And on the right is a freezer farm at the UPS hub. Just four days after uh, FDA authorization, the Pfizer vaccine was injected into the first recipient, Sandra Lindsay, a nurse at the New York hospital. So why does this vaccine and the Moderna vaccine need to be kept frozen? Part of the reason is the immunogen. mRNA is particularly unstable and degrades quickly. The ribose backbone is many orders less stable than deoxyribose in DNA. The single strand of RNA forms secondary structures which can add to instability, and the uracils kind of stick out of the strand and are targets for toll-like receptors of the innate immune response, which flag them for degradation. Also, the nanoparticles, um, which encapsulate the mRNA are made from four different lipids shown here for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. And these are temperature sensitive. Um, the different lipids employed and the different engineered changes to the mRNA codes are likely part of the reason that the Pfizer vaccine can be stored and distributed uh, at a higher temperature, at a lower temperature, sorry, than the Moderna vaccine, which is at minus 20 mRNA vaccines are new to human medicine, though they've been in development for a couple of decades. The science of vaccinology started, as you will all know, with the smallpox vaccine tested first in 1796 by Edward Jenner. This is a live attenuated vaccine. Since then, vaccines have been developed for uh, comprising killed whole organisms or fragments. Uh, recombinant proteins, protein subunits, polysaccharides, non-pathogenic viruses and bacteria engineered to express antigens of pathogens, and toxoids. Except for the attenuated vaccines, many of these include an adjuvant to aid in stimulating protective immunity, which is particularly sensitive to temperature. Aside from those vaccines formulated as, um, as aqueous suspensions, most vaccines would have short shelf lives, but for being stabilized by one of several methods, which are all basically designed to reduce, bind, or solidify the water in the product. By such methods as lyophilization, spray drying, foam drying, freezing, or cryopreservation. And the immunogen and the method used for stabilization help to define the optimum temperature for storage and distribution. There are five basic temperature ranges, ambient, two to eight using fridges, minus 20 in standard freezers, minus 80 in ultra low freezers, and for vaccines comprising live eukaryotic cells below minus 150. Generally, vaccine stability over time, the retention of potency is better at lower temperatures. This graph is hypothetical. However, for example, the red line closely approximates the lyophilized measles vaccine, which loses one log of potency over approximately 18 months stored at, my, at two to eight, a loss that is considered acceptable in the industry. While the cryopreserved scenario PFSPZ vaccine stored below minus 150, the, blue line, the green line, sorry, at the top, has been shown in clinical trials to experience no loss in potency over at least four years, the longest time tested to date. Of the 10 vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 that have so far been authorized or approved for use, most are stored and shipped at two to eight degrees, shown in the right-hand column, well, with only the Moderna and the first iteration of the Sputnik V vaccine stored at minus 20 and the Pfizer at minus 80. The number of countries that have approved these vaccines is increasing by the day. And as of yesterday, the Pfizer vaccine has been approved for use in 61 countries. Of all the vaccines that have been licensed by the FDA, most are stored and shipped at two to eight degrees. The ones in parentheses um, are not yet licensed. With just four, smallpox, varicella, zoster, and one of the MMR vaccines, in addition to the Moderna vaccine requiring minus 20 storage. And the Ebola vaccine, which I shall come back to later, keeping the Pfizer vaccine company at minus 80. The eukaryotic and anti-cancer vaccines, the CAR-T cellular therapies, are distributed in liquid nitrogen vapor phase. Now, the holy grail for vaccine logisticians is a vaccine that can be stored and distributed at ambient temperatures. No human vaccines yet fit this requirement. 
Vivotif, the lyophilized vaccine against typhoid fever, formulated as an enteric coated capsule, comes close. Now, the vaccine for, for cattle lungworm, now called Huskvac, is a radiation attenuated live ambient um, or vaccine ordered for the farmer by his veterinarian and delivered within a week by first class mail for immediate use, just in time logistics. Pfizer has also taken a very different path for distributing its vaccine, keeping control of the process right to the clinic and contracting FedEx and UPS for transportation to and from their distribution hubs. This is a typical hub and spoke uh, distribution system for cold chain. By contrast, Moderna has taken a more traditional approach, contracting the logistics arm of McKesson to organize the shipping of its hub and to its hub and subsequent distribution. McKesson distributes the childhood vaccines for the CDC in the USA. The two to eight cold chain is the default for almost all vaccines and particularly for the childhood vaccines distributed within the WHO's expanded program on immunization in low and middle income countries. These cold chains typically have multiple steps as shown in the bottom. Um, as many as two or three stops between the central distribution hub and the immunization clinic. Contrast this with the hub and spoke system, which di distributes directly from the central hub right out to the clinic. One example of this traditional distribution network for vaccines is that operated by the EPI in Tanzania, which from a central hub in Dar es Salaam distributes to nine zonal hubs thence up to 24 district depots from each zone, and from there, the district depots to the hospitals, clinics, health facilities, and dispensaries, of which there are, in 2020, uh, 8,497. We're working, as indicated in my introduction, um, towards a phase three clinical trial of PFSPZ vaccine against malaria in Equatorial Guinea. That will be our, one of our first phase three trials. This is in Central Africa. And this will transition into a malaria elimination campaign that will use a, utilize a hub and spoke distribution system for the vaccine. The liquid nitrogen vapor phase dry shippers used for transporting the vaccine um, have working hold times from between one to four weeks, depending on uh, their size and payload. And these remain in the clinic while vaccine is being dispensed returning to the hub for liquid nitrogen recharging and restocking. Here we see um, vaccine being distributed to one of our clinical trials at CASO in southern Mali. And on the, on the right, uh, you can see the dry shipper open showing the vaccine in the payload compartment um, with the two temperature monitoring devices. There are actually many advantages uh, to using liquid nitrogen based uh, distribution of vaccine. In, in remote locations. Unlike dry ice, which is difficult to find in many places, liquid nitrogen is quite widely available. Dry shippers are independent of electricity and function as local temporary storage uh, units. And the chance of temperature excursions is considerably reduced in events like the one you see on the right, um, which could be just an inconvenience rather than a total loss. Um, and as shown by a comparative cost analysis, which demonstrated little to no difference, as you see in the bottom line highlighted in the red box, uh, little to no difference between um, the cold chain developed around liquid nitrogen vapor phase and a traditional um, two to eight cold chain for a standard lyophilized vaccine. Um, distribution below minus 150 is widely used in the veterinary field. And there are around 11 vaccines distributed this way for, for livestock. And there are also many other products too distributed using liquid nitrogen vapor phase. Now vaccine containers play an important role in logistics. The standard vaccine vial is a 2 ml glass vial with a stopper closure and a crimped cap for the cover. The Pfizer vaccine vial is shown on the left here. Some vaccines are distributed in pre-filled syringes such as swine flu and flu mist. Um, but this format brings other problems. The standard vaccine vials are good down to minus 80, but below this temperature due to differential contractility and the stopper becoming rigid at low temperature, 
the gap between the vial and the stopper opens up, compromising the container closure integrity. For vaccines stored and distributed at cryogenic temperatures, different containers are required, such as bags and vials with sealable tubes for loading and removing product, for example, the cell seal tubes of Cook Regentech. Smaller volumes can be stored at cryogenic temperatures using the closed fill vials of aseptic technologies or the vials with a foil seal protected septum from SiO2. I've mentioned that the temperature of the Pfizer vaccine shipment is continuously monitored. There are increasing numbers of devices that can perform this function, some shown on the top right. The most economical is the vaccine vial monitoring system that employs temperature sensitive labels which come in four different sensitivity levels for use with different vaccines that have different temperature stabilities. These labels change color based on accumulated temperature excursions and durations of exposure. Only the two vials on the top left uh, would pass the test for use in immunizations. The other two have changed color and would fail. Um, monitoring is becoming increasingly sophisticated particularly for high value products with real time temperatures, GPS locations and other metrics accessible by mo mobile devices. I have video feeds in addition to all my control, to the control parameters of my cryobanks accessible through an Amazon cloud app on my phone, for example. Uh, vaccines require ancillary materials too. Um, that includes syringes, needles, sharps, containers, wipes, band-aids, forms, and for lyophilized vaccines and the Pfizer, Pfizer multidose vials, also diluent. The combined weight and bulk of the ancillary supplies is substantial. For 1 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, it's estimated that 205 thermal containers weighing with the dry ice some 7.5 metric tons and occupying 19 cubic meters and the ancillary supplies, including syringes and diluent and so on, um, add up to over 250 cubic meters and weigh twice as much as a vaccine. All of this is equivalent to three fully loaded 18-wheeler articulated trucks. So that's the equivalent um, for shipping 1 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine. Now, I'd mentioned that the only other vaccine and currently the only FDA licensed vaccine to require a minus 80 cold chain is the Ebola vaccine. This is shipped from the manufacturer to the main distribution hubs in dry ice. And from there, vaccine is repackaged into Arctec shipping containers that maintain temperature below minus 60 using phase change panels. At the satellite hubs, the vaccine vials are thawed, syringes are prepared, and 12 syringes are loaded into each cold box and carried the last mile to the immunization sites. The Ebola vaccine was deployed in West Africa to combat the 2014-15 Ebola outbreak, and more recently in the outbreak in the Congo. It's now being used again in Guinea and the DRC in the two new outbreaks that have occurred over the last couple of weeks. In the earlier West African outbreak, the vaccine was shipped to three main hubs shown by those um, kind of red, um, pale, pale orange uh, dots. Um, and then from there out to the satellite hubs, the green squares, and then to the clinics. Um, now the legacy of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, epidemic will include a vastly improved logistics infrastructure, and particularly a network of ultra low temperature freezers, able to and ready to handle the next minus 80 distributed vaccines against the next pandemic. Echoing Winston Churchill's words that a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity and an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty, Deborah, Christ Deborah Christensen of PATH has said early on when the media were predicting a logistical nightmare for distributing the Pfizer vaccine that she believed that it could be done. And for example, the Ebola vaccine was successfully distributed in Africa and it has been done. As a footnote, I'm getting my Pfizer shot tomorrow. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Daniel Catchpool, president of the Society for Biological and Environmental Repositories, will now introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Eric. It was a wonderful talk. And on behalf of ISBA, I would uh, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. Um, uh, this webinar. 
um, this joint webinar between ISBA and uh, the Society for Cryobiology. Um, our next speaker is John Littica, who is a health scientist based in Austin, uh, sunny Austin, Texas, not so sunny at the moment. Uh, he is a uh, has a career where he has balanced uh, studies into individual health as well as population health and, and an academic record and applied research. Um, and he works at the intersection of local health and global health. As a health scientist and consultant, he assesses diff uh, and develops and builds strong and robust systems that meet both individual and population health needs. And he's worked in diverse topics such as tuberculosis prevention uh, and control, hepatitis B, maternal infant health and public health emergency pre pre preparedness. He has uh, consulted with uh, Texas state agencies, local health departments uh, through tech throughout Texas uh, over the last 15 years. He currently works on vaccine cold chain storage and management and distribution. Dr. Lidica holds a PhD in pharmacoeconomics, a master's of public health and a master's of, of uh, medical science, well, well uh, um, accredited. Uh, and these come from the University of Texas, uh, the London School of Hygiene and uh, Tropical Medicine and the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he holds a, a Bachelor of Arts uh, in Geography, so he knows where he is, um, and at, from the University of Carolina in Chapel Hill. So uh, we'd like to invite Dr. Lidica to give his presentation now on uh, entitled COVID-19 Vaccine Delivery at the Last Mile Issues and Solutions. Thank you very much. Daniel, thank you very much. And I know where I am, but I'm confused because it's supposed to be warm and sunny. Instead, we have 15 centimeters or, or about four inches of snow on the ground. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit of more granularity about getting the shots in people's arms. And, and the thing that I want folks to take away from this presentation is this, and it's gonna be the recurring theme. Until we get shots in people's arms, we will not exit this crisis. A lot of good work has been done to get the vaccine developed very quickly and to get it out. But until we get the vaccine in people's arms, we will continue to be in this crisis. So I just want you to kind of think about that as we continue to go through. So what does the last mile look like? And for my metrically inclined friends, uh, the last 1.6 kilometers, I think it looks like these two things here in the yellow box, vaccine delivery, and shots in arms. But as I was thinking about this, as I was putting the presentation together, I was thinking what an amazing timeline we've had from February 2020, where the pandemic was recognized, to December 2020, where we first saw some of the first doses in people's arms. And it was exciting to see that here in Austin, Texas, at one of our closed pod clinics. But if we think about a lot of things have been done, the virus is identified, commitment to investment and funding, there was this incredible vaccine science, much of which Eric has, has, has talked about, and it's just amazing, particularly around the mRNA technology, and then tooling up the vaccine manufacturing, both with mRNA and for the adenovirus technologies. But we're here now, we're at this figurative final mile, or this 1.6 kilometers. How do we get vaccine delivered, and how do we get it in, in people's arms? And so there's three things that I want to talk about. I want to talk about cold chain, the local distribution sites, the point of distribution sites, this idea of thawing, preparing, and administering vaccine. I want to talk about prioritizing populations and about this idea of equity, vulnerability, and disproportionality uh, in terms of getting uh, people the vaccine as quickly as possible, and then the shots in the arms. How do we get shots in the arms? The quantity that we need to reach herd immunity, building that capacity and getting that throughput. So when I think about the last mile, I think about cold chain logistics and everything that Eric said is exactly the types of things that I would think about. The delivery of the vaccine to a local health department, the receipt storage and staging. You have to inventory this, you have to put it aside, you have to put it in the storage, you have to monitor the storage. You have to do this without temperature excursions. You also then have to repackage and prepare to transport this to smaller points of distribution sites where the vaccine will actually be administered. Uh, you have to deliver it to those sites. And then once at those sites, you have to prepare and administer the vaccine and you have to keep track of the doses, the doses that go in people's arms and uh, the doses that are either wastage or if you have a temperature excursion, quarantining and contacting the vaccine manufacturer. The challenge with this is that in normal times, it's usually with vaccines of around the two to eight degrees Celsius, as Eric had talked about. But remember, we're managing a fragile mRNA vaccine requiring the ultra cold storage. And this prevents, presents its own logistical challenges. 
if you had asked me a year ago, I would have said from the local perspective that this would have been the number one issue that we would have been facing with. And we've been working on this for about three years in Austin, Texas to address this, but I still thought it was going to be the problem. Surprisingly, this has not been a problem. Uh, it is working. We're able to get the, the vaccine to the people. And particularly because of some of the, the reasons that Eric talked about in terms of uh, the, the storage containers that are used uh, from the point of manufacturing to the point of delivery, that had been a remarkable success. So I'm gonna give this a check mark, a green check mark, and say that we've done okay. When we look at priority populations, this is another thing that's particularly important because we have to decide who's gonna get the vaccine in what order, particularly early on when we have um, a limited amount of vaccines. This is a slide that I prepared for discussions that we had in Austin, Texas, where we talk about how we're going to think about this. This is slightly different from what the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and others have come out and said, this is our phased approach. But we wanted to encapsulate this. What are the important things that we need to look at? The first important thing is we have to secure the health infrastructure. We have to protect those who are going to protect us from the disease and whom we have the least redundancy, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the custodial staff, the uh, frontline admin staff, folks that if they get sick, the whole system collapses. They're a priority for initial vaccination. Moving then into preventing severe disease and death, we know that there are individuals who have risk conditions for COVID-19 related mortality. These are people who are older. The older you go up the age scale, the more likely you are to die of a COVID-19 related uh, issue. Folks with certain comorbidities face the same thing. So trying to make sure that we're getting vaccine to those so we can prevent severe disease in, death in those populations most at risk. Then we also need to think about protecting our essential workers. Those people who are gonna get our economy working again and getting our kids back to school the teachers, the nurses, the construction workers, the restaurant workers, the first responders, not in, in A above, the people who work in grocery stores. We've got to get them back to work so we can get our economy open again. And then finally, looking at the broader community where we need to get herd immunity, prevent, uh, disrupt person-to-person -person transmission, where we get the entire community uh, vaccinated. This is something I think that we have done well uh, during this crisis. We had experience with this with H1N1 with a lot of work that had uh, gone on. So I think we're doing well with this. So I'm going to give this a green check mark. The other issue I think is this idea of the shots in arms. And I'm going to use an example uh, from Austin, Texas. It's a publication that my colleagues uh, Naomi Tamez, Wes Turkowski, and Dr. Richard Taylor and I worked on starting back in October. Zesus was the editor for this in Frontiers and Public Health. And for us, it was thinking about, okay, so we know vaccine is coming. We know we need to get it in people's arms. We need to think about how this is actually going to roll out because it, it seems pretty straightforward. You get vaccines, people get their shots. But we're really no longer talking about public health here. We're talking about logistics and we're talking about operations with project planning and pragmatism included. And so when we were thinking about this, we were thinking, okay, so what, what's the end goal here? Well, the end goal is herd immunity. Uh, estimates on the lower end are at 67%. We're hearing now with some of the new strains that are circulating, it could be as high as 75 or 80%. But for us, we, we looked at 67% and said, okay, this is the, the vaccine coverage rate that we need. The estimate of our population numbers in Austin, Texas, um, or in Travis County more particular, which surrounds us, the 10th largest metropolitan area in the United States is 1.27 million people. So if we take 67% of 1.27 with two doses, that means 1.7 million vaccines that need to go in people's arms. That's a lot of vaccine. And again, I'll say it again, 1.7 million vaccines. Item four is, I think, is where we're falling down. It's who's going to give the shots and where will the shots be given? There's been a trend uh, over the last couple of, of years, particular since particularly since H1N1, to really look and use private providers for this purpose, the doctor's offices, the pharmacies. It was a remarkable success in H1N1, but it's not going to work with COVID-19. And the reason is several fold. Is one is the numbers are just too high. We don't have enough people, enough doctor's offices, and enough pharmacies who can reach the throughput that we need. And when we think about the type of throughput we need to distribute 1.7 doses of vaccine, that means we're having to do 65,000 doses a week in one, one county, in one state, in one country. 
65,000 doses a week. We don't have enough doctor's offices and pharmacies to do this. So we need to think about going back to the good old days of mass vaccination clinics, which is what uh, public health emergency preparedness has been planning on since uh, the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax attacks uh, after uh, 2001. I invite you to look at this article, the Frontiers in Public Health article for more details about this. But my central thesis is we cannot vaccinate ourselves out of this problem just by uh, private physicians, offices and pharmacies. But instead, we need to go to mass vaccination sites. They are the only ones, things that we have that can provide the economies of scale that we need for throughput. And remember, we are not successful against COVID-19 until everyone who wants a shot gets a shot. And I'm going to repeat that because to me, it's critically important. We are not successful against COVID-19 until everyone who wants a shot gets a shot. So the faster we can get shots into people's arms, the faster we can exit this crisis. And I'll talk a little bit about the social fabric and some of the issues that, that we need to think about of the importance of exiting this crisis as quickly as we can. But when we think about mass vaccination clinics, we think about the logistics. Eric talked about the cold chain management. There's economies of scales of doing this in mass vaccination sites where you can have output of 10,000 uh, doses a week. You have specialists who can support the cold chain management, specialists who can manage the vaccines, specialists who can repackage and deliver. These are not skill sets that anyone can just pick up. It is a skill set that, that is honed over time. Operations venue operations, getting the big places, getting the parking, getting the facilities, getting the people online, getting them moved through in order to get the vaccine, having the post-vaccine waiting to monitor for adverse events, and then also preparing the vaccine for administration. Again, as Eric had talked about, there's a lot that goes on with reconstituting, putting it in the syringes, but you also have your thawing and so forth for that. Throughput, confirming medical history before a nurse or another vaccinator provides the vaccine, actually providing the jab. And we're seeing here in Austin, Texas, at the one mass vaccination clinic that we have, that we're able to get people through in about three minutes. So if you think about having, you know, 15 or 20 vaccinators, at three person, at one person from every three minutes, that's a pretty good throughput. And then administrative, there's, there's economies of scale of having one entity in charge and a locality in charge of the vaccine for data entry, for uh, vaccine registry purposes, and for scheduling. But when I think about all of this, the question for me, though, is why does this matter? And for me, it's about the social fabric, and it's the social fabric of our society depends on us being able to exit this crisis. We've been at this a year. We're going to be at this through the end of this year, at least, if, at least in Austin, Texas, with uh, uh, the need to, to, to ramp up to 65,000 doses, which we're nowhere near yet at this point in time. We're going to be through this through the end of the year, but we're not going to solve this problem with lockdowns. We're not going to solve it with contact tracing, and we're not going to solve it by depending on pharmacies and GP surgeries and private doctor's offices to provide vaccinations. The capacity is not there. The only way that we can solve this crisis is by mass vaccination clinics. And for those of you who know me, I've, I've recently returned from Australia. My friends in Townsville will know this is what I my something I've been saying since day one, we are most certainly not all in this together. There are those who are at the economic margin of society who have been crushed by this pandemic. And these are the people that are going to continue to be crushed every day until we vaccinate, vaccinate, and vaccinate. So again, I come back and say, we do not exit this crisis until everybody who gets a vaccine wants a vaccine. We're even seeing this uh, kind of social issues playing out in the press and also in some studies that I've been working on. Le Monde reported this week on Wednesday in a study that 56% of French believe that there's a conflict between the older age groups and the younger age group. And in fact, this study confirms that those who are 18 to 34 years old believe that they're the primary collateral victims of the pandemic. So we're starting to see class issues come up in, in terms of economics, in terms of age groups, where people are beginning to think that they're the ones who are suffering the most, and people are. In Austin, Texas, we've been working on social determinants of health uh, survey, trying to understand uh, the impact of, of, of the pandemic, surveying people before the pandemic began, or asking them questions about their social determinants of health in January of this year, before the pandemic began, and in November and December of this year. 
And when we ask folks about their income in November, December this year, there were two people who actually wrote in an answer rather than, than choosing one of the responses, the, 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 the categorical responses that we had. One person wrote in and said, my husband and I are both currently unemployed due to COVID. So this means that there's somebody who can't pay their rent, they can't pay their mortgage, they're probably having trouble putting food on the table, they want to work and they can't, we've got to get these people back to work so they can function normally. And then we had another person when we asked about income said barely surviving. So again, this matters because it's the social fabric of our society. So what I want to leave you with is the reason that vaccination is so important, the reason that we need to make sure that we're getting as many shots in as many people's arms that wants it is because it is about the social fabric of our society and that each day that we are not putting a shot in someone's arm is one more day that we are pulling this fabric apart one thread at a time. And with that, I am going to end my presentation and turn it over to Zesis. Thank you very much, John. Um, the next presentation is going to be provided to us by Dr. Shashi Wei. Dr. Wei is an award-winning startup entrepreneur and chemistry professional in the area of biomimetic nanoscience and biopreservation and regenerative medicine. She's been persistent on her life vision to enable organs on demand since a very young age. And she's pursued her scientific endeavor by studying chemistry in the US. She founded Extherma in San Francisco Bay in October 2014 and has led the breakthrough innovation in biopreservation, which has demonstrated successful traction in regenerative medicine from cell and gene therapy, tissue engineering to whole organs for transplant. The highest impact of this technology is expected to save about 80% of the wasted human organs that are discarded for transplant, by extending the organ cell life from hours to days. Dr. Wei is the PI of 10 federal and state grants to develop breakthrough cryoprotectants. She led the Exterma Research Endeavors at the Molecular Foundry at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory from 2015 to 2020. Dr. Wei, you may begin your presentation entitled Magic on Ice, Next Generation DMSO-Free Biopreservation. Dr. Wei, you're on mute right now and you might want to um, swap your screens. Okay. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Yes, now we can see it. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, Zysis, and thank you, Esper and the Society for Cryobiology. I'm really honored to have this opportunity to share some of the efforts we made here to bring on some magic on ice and bring in new generation BMSO-free biopreservation. So um, the COVID, COVID year really taught us, like, they um, um, brought us the field of a cryo Cryopreservation preservation um, into the spotlight. Like uh, we not only not only the Wall Street and uh, um, our professional, which is you guys all here, talking about uh, how we can make this better. Even like a grandma, um, my grandma, and she actually knows something about like uh, oh, it's very difficult to keep these vaccines alive and keep them cold. So. Um, um, with, it's like a real world a scenario taught for us, like a successful science is just the first step. Actually, biomanufacturing, coaching, logistics will push us to the last mile to success to bring um, the final cure um, for the COVID and um, bring us back to the normal again. So um, thank you, John and Eric, who gave us a great talk on the um, COVID to, um, vaccine logistics. For me, actually, I would like to bring you another focus on the cell gene therapy um, forefront, which already shows great uh, promise to help us to get better um, when we get a COVID and the, um, cure the patients. So, you know, as a live the cells, actually, um, they bring in another layer of um, um, complexity 
in terms of the biopreservation, the coachings, because they are alive and they're full functional and they're intact, intact the cells. So um, it's a, a particularly more challenging in this field. So you can see, um, You can see, like an, um, in the whole process, the bioproservation is used throughout the whole process. It takes three to five times to cool and freeze during the process um, before it becomes the uh, drug for the patients. And then when we move towards the allogeneity therapies in the solid tumor field, bioproservation and cell banking will play even more crucial roles um, to make a successful manufacturing process. But um, if you look at the biopreservation solution, which we use to, to defeat the ice and the protect it from the uh, ice damage, which we're still using the DMSO, first being discovered, successfully preserved the red blood cells since 1950s. Half centuries later, we're still using DMSO plus the high concentration of uh, serum products. So definitely, it works uh, for certain cells. However, once we move towards to sensitive primary cell um, therapy product, we see some headwind. So in this case, like a, a lot of the cell types, especially sensitive cell types, after freestyle, we immediately take a hit, 15% to 75% of the survivals. But after time, the survival will get lower. And more importantly, cell functions are in, um, impacted here. So because the DMSO is really not an inert small molecule, actually it's very active in the bio process um, procedure and it shows the versatile toxicity from the um, patient site lead to a lot of uh, vomiting diarrhea issues. And the more alarmingly, actually it can lead to the burst the chromosome damages in the cellular level. And the recent publications in Nature shows DMSO even 0.1% continuous culture can lead to 50% of a proteomic changes um, and uh, up to 70% um, transcriptome changes, which is uh, very alarming for localized uh, injections. Plus, we need to involve with the serum components. That's another layer of the risk and the batch-to-batch -batch variation and uh, um, process um, issues. So, here, we're definitely looking for a next generation non-toxic solutions can um, replace the DMSO and those serum components. Xenera take this challenge by looking at a completely different spectrum. We see nature already have a great answer for us. They are antifreeze proteins, serve as the secret weapon that allows some fish to survive in the Arctic Ocean without ice damage. So really amazing um, proteins actually um, However, we do not have a, um, a commercial viability and a use for human. So Exterma um, take the approach to learn from this nature's uh, secret, pioneer novel nanoscience with the robotic synthesis and uh, um, AI design to successfully make a biomimetic drug-like compound we named XTV4 to um, serve as a new generation antifreeze molecule that's acting similarly to antifreeze protein. Um, now we're able to show a superior cell viability, functionality, post selling because the main difference here is we use a very low concentration, which does not generate the genomic nor in vivo toxicity you generally see from the DMSO product. And that this as a um, chemically defined solution can give us a reliable performance every time. A um, little bit of uh, how this really works. Um, for successful biopreservation, especially on cryopreservation, size and shape of ice really matters. Um, um, you can see the image here. This is a gold standard polarized light microscopy splat assay. Um, under the, um, under the um, polarized light, the ice crystal size formed um, in this shape. You can see the middle one shows XTV at very low concentration, be able to maintain um, very small and round ice crystal structures. Over time, they also can overcome the um, ice recrystallization process. Um, however, compared to the um, 
the water which is on the top and an antifreeze protein type three on the bottom, we can see a much smaller size um, being maintained. And this really holds the secret XTV will be able to effectively control the ice. With that, so we'll be able to build the uh, first the product and formulate it to make a DMSO free serum-free, protein-free, and a completely chemically defined solution. We name it the XT Thrive. This is the main, this is aimed to make for um, substitute the current DMSO solutions for GMP production of the cells and to achieve the more flexible manufacturing process and to get a, a better um, post -cell, cell performance and uh, um, cell um, survivals. So, I'm not intended to make a commercial here. Uh, it's just like you're showing, this is the product that's being used by, by many pilot studies, in which we're gonna deliver some data on the next slide. Um, so for, for cell gene therapy fields, survival of the cells is one thing, but the, more importantly, is the cell functions. For example, in the bone marrow transplant field, we all know 10% of the MSO and 90% of the serum has been used as the gold standard. And we always can reach about 90% immediate uh, uh, post-op viability. However, this really does not tell the whole story. So here we conducted a study with the Vitalant research group from the um, Marcus and Phillips really should dive deeper into the two stem cells that matters. Though we share very similar post op viability immediately, um, but if you see deeper down for the CD34 positive cells and the CD34 um, positive cell, CD133 positive cells, XT Thrive group is able to make double or triple the amount of the important stem cells, which will be transformed into the in vivo studies. And then we also um, work with the CAR-T developers to, to solve some of the major challenges. So um, after sawing the cells, um, going for reprogramming, um, the clients really care about the nuclear fraction efficiency. Here we're able to show actually from the XT Thrive um, groups um, we generate a very similar closest level to the fresh cells in terms of nuclear fraction level and the versus the 10% um, DMSO groups generally have a much lower um, programming efficiency. Um, here I'm really really uh, excited to share with you some recent development uh, um, data independently validated by Agent for Science and Technology and the Research from Singapore, the Allogeny Stem Cell Manufacturing Program. We know like since the pandemic time, there are 71 Ms. McCamel stem cell clinical trial registered through the world, which makes us make this a very promising uh, therapeutics is potentially help the patient go over the COVID. So that make this a GMP standard uh, scale up become critical for the industry. Here we validate uh, strictly comparison with XT Thrive and uh, leading GMP standard, the 10% DMSO product to preserve uh, viability and the um, um, pr um, preservation properties pre-freeze and the post in the monolayer and the microcarrier 3D suspension cultures. A little bit of background here. Um, in the field, we see a lot of challenges because the DMSO has its toxicity. So we have to maintain a relatively short time pre-freeze incubation, post incubation, all the way towards to the patient administration. So if we can extend this time, they will be very beneficial for the large scale production. Also, nowadays, large scale productions are moving towards the serum free process. Um, but the way all know serum free media is still often sacrificed with the performance. So we're looking for if there's the options we can see um, serum free process to help the in the cryopreservation preservation steps and to remove the batch batch variations and uh, um, serum QC. So in this study, 
we take the patient-derived MSC and then uh, do a triplicate condition in each group, um, use the um, uh, cool cell for um, freezing process and no control rate freezer, and uh, store the cells in the liquid nitrogen for one week long, and they're going through the control sawing process, and then move on to the culture, which one is the monolayer growing the tea flask, and another one's microcarrier 3D culture. So first we look at um, an important um, um, parameters. So we want to understand so like if we can extend the pre-freeze uh, incubation time. Uh, so here we stretch this uh, to 24 hours of continuous monitoring at the room temperature, soaking three groups with the MSC cells and then check the viability after sawing. You can see here, um, after 24 hours um, continuous soaking, the XT thrive group will still be able to maintain 90% of viability in comparison, the 10% DMS group uh, has dropped down the viability significantly, about 30%. And the next step, uh, we also care about um, um, if we can extend the post-thaw incubation time this is uh, very important for any clinical practice because it's very difficult to, to control in the clinical site for cell gene therapy, especially um, on the sawing process. Often the hospital will allow two hours long um, sawing in the back of a DMSO, which we know like it has to show some significant degrading of the cell quality. In this case, we're able to show six hours extension of the time and still maintain 90% viability versus the DMSO group who can drop down to, again, close to 30%. Um, in the serum containing media, and we see all groups that shows very healthy um, continuous proliferations, um, growth curve right after thawing for six days at a time. However, this is situation reversed. So once you get into the serum-free media, there is a um, big difference that has been shown here. Um, but, um, um, extensively, after six days of continuous culture, um, XD thrive groups are able to exhibit about 2.5-fold um, um, growth uh, capability compared to the control uh, DMSO group especially on the day two, we successfully avoid this uh, like a downslope curve that continuously um, bring in the upstream for proliferation. Another question we want to answer is, uh, can, we, uh, can we successfully um, um, check the surface markers and uh, are, are the MSC cells still maintain the good stimulus? Here, the answer is yes. All groups shows no infections for the MSC surface markers for expansion in the three phases during the culture, post thaw, and the, um, the after the recovery, and the, in the serum free and the serum contained condition. And at the same time, we also check the um, during the three phase the for um, uh, the colony formation. Um, analysis, we can see indeed the uh, um, uh, axis thrive group did not affect the colony formations and the continuous resulting in a good, uh, um, good colony and a healthy colony. So uh, we're very delighted to bring in the conclusion here um, from the A-STAR um, uh, -star program. So XT thrive group resulting in significantly improved viability for MSC before freezing and the post thaw when the cell were kept at the room temperature for extended hours, and especially if the cells were cultured in serum-free media. And uh, this is considered as a huge advantages in manufacturing process, especially for the process of a filing, uh, um, final filling and uh, transportation. We also, um, uh, we also would like to uh, help in the um, coaching management sectors. 
um, because it's very important to um, um, get an effective and uh, effective um, coaching to, to deliver the raw material to centralized manufacturing and take care of it from the um, final product QC to the patient on the bedside. Um, so in this mm -hmm. case, so we are thinking like a, is it possible for us to remove the need of the liquid nitrogen and the dry ice and the warm up the coaching. So here um, we're really um, happy to see XT Vivo, the compound itself, has a very strong water freezing temperature depression efficiency, which allowing us to use a very low concentration to depress water freezing temperature and then in the between zero degrees C to minus 20 degrees C, we can form this ice-free condition to preserve the biological samples for extended time. So uh, we'll be able to build this turnkey solutions now um, can potentially remove the using liquid nitrogen and dry ice, um, just uh, as uh, John mentioned, to help um, better delivery of the vaccines or biologics to the remote area uh, without needing very restricted um, extreme coaching condition. So uh, we're really grateful to have a lot of support from the Department of Defense and all the other agencies in this case and allowing us to achieve some breakthrough data in the cell tissue and the whole organ field. For the cell gene therapy field, um, using this method actually it can achieve some easy processing. Um, you can avoid using some um, um, very um, involved car preservation procedures just to pause it for a few days for the cell growth. And for the tissue engineering part, we truly see some like a game changing happening here, such as so we see the um, IPSC derived 3D cultures shows a great promise for using for therapeutic um, Purpose. However, during the manufacturing process, using traditional crop preservation methods, number one, um, you get a really low recovery. For this example, actually, the immediate recovery is less than 15%. And more importantly, those uh, hard cells actually take them a very long time to come back to beat again, which is a uh, major issue. Um, but here we're able to show like a um, the healthy beatings are coming back right after freezing. And uh, of course, the biggest breakthrough I have achieved here is to make organ transplant, um, freeze the organ down to minus five degrees C without ice formation, su successfully extended it for 24 hours, um, and they retain the 100% successful retransplant into the mice working at Johns Hopkins. Um, Dr. Wei, um, apologies for this, but we're running out of time. And in the sake of allowing for a couple of questions, I would ask you to um, conclude this part of the presentation yes. before yes. opening Yes, um, it's the end of the, uh, my presentation, and thank you very much. And uh, um, I'm glad to um, get some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. So this concludes the presentation segment of the webinar. We will now begin the question and answer portion of the question. You may type your question into the question box as individuals have already done. Uh, I will hand over to the presidents, Adam and Dan for leading us through the Q and A session. Thank you, Zizis. Um, just uh, one very, very quick, quick question, which I can answer straight now. Um, will the uh, presentations be available after this set the live session? Yes, they will be. Um, they the whole webinar will be made available on both the websites of ISBA and the Society for Cryobiology. So please go to those websites. And I'd also encourage you to explore their websites if you're not a member of either society. Find out a bit more about what they do. Um, and I know from ISBA's point of view, there's a whole range of uh, talks around the COVID problem that we have generated over the last year. Um, so there's a, a lot of educational material there. Um, please answer, uh, post your questions in the chat box. Uh, we have one question, which I think is for um, Zha Zhi. Um, has the XT been evaluated on apheresis or T cells? Um. The answer is yes. So we have some validations on the um, PBMCs and uh, some CAR T applications. Great. 
Just waiting for any more questions coming through. Uh, Adam, do you want to take this one? Uh, sure. Um, so we have a, a question for Xiaoji again. Uh, wondering if you use DMSO free and serum free media for cryopreservation. So you, so how do you cryo preserve the the cells that you're working with? What are the cryoprotectants that you're using? Yeah. Um, so for the traditional cryopreservation process, the XT Thrive, actually um, you can just directly replace the um, um, DMSO containing the solution and just use this uh, um, use the cell pellet and the soaking to the solution without needing additional uh, control cooling process, additional uh, serum components. So um, just a plug and play into your current process. I have a question for John if we don't get any more from the audience. Um, it yeah. sounds like um, that it would be helpful to have mass vaccination clinics kind of everywhere the, the vaccine is being distributed. And I'm wondering, are there policy recommendations that you'd have for like the federal government or state governments for, for how to implement that? Yeah, I, I, I well, I would agree. I mean, my, my thesis is that we do need the mass vaccination clinics just because the numbers don't work any other ways. And, you know, what's funny about this is, you know, 15 years of public health emergency preparedness planning, we have planned on having mass vaccination clinics. And all of a sudden, this has been upended. And the policy recommendation that I would have is just go back to the planning that we've done. The plans are there. It's, it's not rocket science. I'm not a rocket scientist. I laugh and I say, you know, this is just simple math. And if you look at the math of where we need to be and where we are, it's one point, and again, I use Travis County, 1.7 million doses in people's arms. How are we gonna get it? The math just does not add up. If you have doctors and pharmacies doing the onesies or twosies, you know, they may be able to, you know, they'll be able to do their pit of, you know, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 a week, but nowhere what we need to have done. So my policy recommendation is just go back to all the plans that we've been creating for the last 15 years. Yeah, th uh, thank you, John. Um, I, I know in Australia, we haven't got a, a huge caseload of, of um, we've got a very strong quarantine um, and very few cases are coming into the, the society. Um, and they are talking about uh, just getting your local pharmacist to uh, uh, administer the vaccine. Um, and it's gonna be a very slow rollout, I believe. And I take your point. One question I'd like to ask both um, John and Eric is, um, and we must probably conclude on this question because we're running out of time. Um, but the role of biobanks, I'm, I'm, going, I'm waving the ISBA flag here. Um, it seems to me that we have um, lots and lots of biobanks setting up in different parts of, of, of a country and all around the place, all of who are experts in cold chain management in some way or another. What role do you think a biobanks might have in your hub and spoke model that you were talking about? Um, as being possible rather than, you know, that that being considered as part of the infrastructure. Um, so repurposing already established biobanks um, for the purposes of the vaccine rollout, at least in the short term, to, to meet your goal of, of getting the, the vaccinations out faster. Uh, would you like to make, make, maybe make comment to that? Do you want to go ahead, John, or shall I field the first uh, answer? I'll no, please go ahead, Eric. I'll follow you, sir. Well, well, my um, my impression is that um, biobanks are packed with samples that people have put there that they want to use, and in order to, um, I mean, they're they're a wonderful resource and they have the right equipment, but they're just you'd have to build on top of that to be able to to generate the capacity to expand the um, the, the hub system to be able to take care of that. That's what we see in the EPI, say, in Tanzania, where you've got um, all the vaccines come through for childhood immunizations, and basically the system is solid. In order to bring in a new vaccine, uh, whether it's our vaccine, whether it's a new vaccine for some other childhood disease, they have to build in extra capacity to be able to make it work. 
and I would think, you know, biobanks can provide um, a useful model and a way of handling, but in order to have them take on additional functions as hubs, they would have to increase the infrastructure. Maybe they're able to do that, but what we've seen so far is that the hubs have been like UPS, FedEx, um, and certain hospitals and other health facilities have been buying up these um, refrigerators, freezers, and ultra-low freezers in order to have their own capacity to do this. Um, yeah. I, I would echo Eric, and I would just say, if you look on a smaller scale of looking at a GP surgery or a private doctor's offices, and, and you, you, know, you look at them as a biobank, you know, particularly ones that do childhood immunizations, they may have some storage capacity already, but to be able to expand to the level that we need, it, it just is not realistically possible. And again, I just urge people to think about the math. It's, it's third grade math. Mm -hmm. Where do we need to go and how much, how much capacity do we have? And I just don't think we can get there with the, the private doctor's offices and the pharmacies. So. Well, with that, we have passed the hour by five minutes and we all have um, other um, things to attend to. Um, so I'll hand to um, Samantha for some final slides and final farewells. And so on my behalf um, of, of representing ISBA, um, I'd really like to thank uh, the speakers for their presentations today. I thank the audience for coming and, and listening and, and answering questions. There will be, uh, the sessions will be, um, as I said, uh, uh, available online and you will, should be able to communicate with people via email uh, your questions um, accordingly. Um, I would like to encourage people to consider looking around the ISBA website, consider uh, joining if you're interested in learning more about standardisation in biobanking practices um, and encourage you all to think about joining us at our ISBA me annual meeting uh, which will be in uh, May this year. It's a full virtual meeting so you don't have to leave the uh, your own lounge chair, but we'd love you to uh, um, uh, come and join us for those meetings to talk about connect and collaborate through biobanking. So thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Society for Cryobiology for joining with us and, and helping us uh, uh, put this particular webinar on. So over to Adam. All right, yeah, I'd also wanted to thank everyone for attending and helping make this webinar happen. Just a few things about the Society for Cryobiology. If you're interested in learning more about the science of cryobiology, cryopreservation, or, or uh, cell tissue uh, or protein preservation, and other uh, using other technologies like drying, um, these topics are discussed at uh, the annual meetings. We'll have a virtual meeting this summer in July um, called Cryo 2021. You can just Google that to find the conference website. And also encourage you to check out the Society for Cryobiology website and consider joining as a member. So once again, we'd like to thank you all for joining today's webinar. Furthermore, we would like to thank Dr. James, Dr. Lidecker, and Dr. Wei for providing this presentation for the, for the international community. Thank you for joining us and have a great day, everyone. <laughs>